This is the new Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra. It's $1,200 and it boasts a zoom range of 13 millimeters to 230 millimeters. And 108 megapixels. It all seems too good to be true. We're professional photographers and YouTubers, Tony and Chelsea Northrup. We test cameras all the time and we're gonna treat this like a real camera, test it and tell you what is real and what doesn't live up to the promises. Yeah, because we use these like you real cameras. We take photos with our phones all of the time and we take video for our YouTube channel using our phones all of the time. We're gonna put it up against the iPhone 13 Pro Max and also the Google Pixel 6 Pro. We're gonna put these three phone cameras through their paces and test them in the categories of portraits, selfies, landscapes, long exposures, astrophotography, macro, and video, including with shallow depth of field. That means a nice blurry background. The winner of this comparison is gonna go up against a real camera. So subscribe to see that upcoming review. And if you wanna tell us what we should compare it against, write a comment down below. Here we go. We're at Devil's Hopyard State Park because I feel like more people than ever are enjoying nature and your smartphone camera is the perfect camera for that. It fits in your pocket, it's weatherproof, and it takes pretty great pictures. So we're gonna test out the image quality on the main lens of the Samsung that's boasting 108 megapixels. Can you believe that? I don't think I can actually. <laughs> It's only the main lens that supports the 108 megapixel mode, so the wide angle lens is not gonna do this. On the left, we have the standard 12 megapixel image, and on the right, we have the 108 megapixel image, enhance. Indeed, the 108 megapixel image is significantly sharper. It's too bad this is turned off by default and only available for one of the four cameras on the Samsung. I'm taking the same photo with the Google Pixel 6 Pro, and it advertises 50 megapixels but it only offers 12 megapixel files. So let's see what that looks like. The pixel image looks way better. The sky is a normal color and the wood's a normal color too. The Samsung image is also way overexposed. Let's check the detail. The 108 megapixel image from the Samsung does indeed have more detail, but I can't figure out why they decided to eliminate all the natural shadows. Even though you can see it has less detail when you zoom way in, the pixel image overall looks way better. You see the same situation comparing the iPhone to the Samsung. The color on the iPhone is excellent and natural. There are normal shadows that the Samsung for some reason decided to eliminate. Why does the Samsung make the snow teal? Let's enhance. Again, the 108 megapixels from the Samsung does show a little bit more detail, though it's pretty slight. Looking up towards the corners, we see terrible chromatic aberration on the Samsung that is non-existent on the iPhone. The photos look good, but it seems like the super high megapixels are mostly marketing. And it really makes sense because to get megapixels like that from a professional camera, you have to spend $6,000 to tens of thousands of dollars. And so I'm not too disappointed about it, but it didn't seem real. Nature photos can be so hard because a scene like this with the river and the bridge, a still photo doesn't really capture it. Let me show you what I mean. The still photo doesn't capture the movement of the river that you see with your eyes, but there is a way to do that. That's by using a long exposure. And in the traditional camera world, the use of that means a tripod and an ND filter. But one of these cameras, the Google Pixel 6 Pro, has a built-in long exposure mode. So let's try it out and see how that compares. Unfortunately, this example just didn't work out. I think the water wasn't moving enough for the pixel to determine that it needed to blur that, and thus the computational photography completely failed us. In fact, all the long exposure did was introduce some shakiness. The next example will look better. I'm gonna take it up a level, put these on a tripod, use an ND filter, and find out which of them have the best manual controls for more serious photographers. I'm also gonna take it up a notch by going to a big waterfall. So it's gonna be loud there, but let's try it out. Of these three phones, only the iPhone has MagSafe built in. Connecting to a tripod has never been easier. 
This moment filter holder snaps right onto the iPhone. Because the iPhone is the most popular platform, there are more accessories available for it. The other phones require you to buy a MagSafe compatible case or use a clumsy clamp attachment. Here's a better example of the Pixel's long exposure motion blur. You can see on the left, the waterfall is frozen in action, and on the right, it's nice and smoothly blurred. Zoom in. It's not quite the effect of a four second long exposure we would get with a traditional camera, but it is nicer than this. On the left are the results from the Samsung camera with the ND filter in manual mode. On the right are the results of the ND filter with the Motion Pro Cam app. You can see without the app, we were able to produce an image at 1 15th of a second using my ND32 filter. A longer exposure would have been better, my ND filter just wasn't dense enough. Still, it looks pretty good and probably better than the Google Pixel image does, even though it did require a tripod and an ND filter. On the right, the app did smooth out the waterfall a little bit more, but it still doesn't have that nice featheriness that we would hope to get. That's because the computational photography captures multiple images and stacks them together, and as a result, it ends up being a little chunky. Here's an example of the iPhone with the ND filter and the long exposure app, and you can see these repeated patterns. That's the result of using computational photography rather than a longer ND filter. This eight second exposure looked better, but again, we still see those repeated patterns that sort of defy the featheriness that we're looking to create. We're at Ocean Beach State Park in New London, Connecticut, and we're getting pictures with each phone. Oh my gosh, it says best shot. The range on this is incredible. You have super wide angle, and then you can zoom in so far that it actually becomes difficult to even find your subject. 100 times zoom is a new game. Find your subject in the frame. You basically have to be a sniper. There's a little bit of lag, so you have to be very steady. Let's try this with the Google 6 Pro as well. Now the iPhone's turn. People will be so happy to see this dethroned. Right away you can see the Samsung image has more detail, but the colors on the iPhone look better. The Thames is not teal, it's more like this color. Zoom in. Look at that incredible detail from the Samsung. Like You can make out this crane, which is completely invisible on the iPhone. I can't believe a telephoto lens this powerful can fit in your pocket. Comparing the Samsung to the Pixel, again, the Pixel's colors are just way better, but zoom in. The Pixel definitely has more detail than the iPhone because you can see that this crane is here, but still, it doesn't come anywhere close to the Samsung. I'm gonna try focusing on something closer because atmospheric conditions like humidity or some fog or something could ruin it. I like that we're at this beautiful place and I just wanna take pictures of signs. Tony, are you thinking about trading in your iPhone now? You can see here the telephoto lens on the Samsung captured so much more detail than the iPhone could. The Samsung is showing you detail in the wood and these zip ties that are simply lost on the iPhone. The Pixel fared better, but it still can't match the incredible detail from the Samsung telephoto. You can see it's creating some weird artifacts around the letters as it tries to create more detail and fails. Here are the three images side by side. Once again, the Samsung's colors are way too teal. This is just bad. The Pixel washed most of the contrast out of the sky. The iPhone did the best job. You can see the warm colors on the horizon from the sunset and the sky color is pretty accurate. With conventional cameras, you can get these super zooms that go from like 28 to 300 millimeters, but there's no lens, no matter what you're willing to spend, that'll go from 16 millimeters all the way out to 220 millimeters. But you can get that with the Samsung. Even these phones don't have quite the same range, but the fact that they go from super wide to medium telephoto, I think is the best possible range. 
All right, right now I'm testing the quintessential sunset photo. And for a good reason. It's even a challenging situation for a traditional camera. You have high dynamic range, which means there's very dark spots in the shadows and the brightness of the sky, and also the colors. Have you ever noticed that you take a picture of a sunset and the colors are not as vivid as you see them? So let's see which one has the best colors, dynamic range, and all the other things you'd want. Photographing the sunset, the iPhone looks much better than the Samsung. For some reason, the Samsung always raises the shadows, which is unnatural. The colors here are off too. The iPhone just looks better. Here's the Samsung compared to the Pixel. You can see the Pixel brought out a lot of the details in the clouds, and this is much more like what our eyes saw than whatever the Samsung created. One of the big improvements of the Samsung S22 over the predecessor, the S21, is better coatings on the lenses to reduce flaring and shooting directly into the sun, it does seem to handle it pretty well. In fact, compared to the iPhone, look at this bit of flaring here. We always have this problem with the iPhone. The Samsung's pretty clean. However, the iPhone's colors and saturation and exposure are better than the Samsung's. The Pixel made the most natural looking photo, though the sky is kind of unsaturated and we do see this spot of flare. Looking closer, I do see a little bit of flaring in the Samsung, but overall the lens is really improved. On the way back, we spotted a hawk in a tree. Makes me wish I had my real camera. That's not bad for a smartphone though. And you can see the 200 millimeter lens on the Samsung really shines here. It captured far more detail than either the iPhone or the Pixel could create. However, the colors are still weird, but the Samsung's requirement for raising the shadows all the way actually helped with this partially backlit subject. Here's the Samsung compared to the best the Pixel could do. If you're a birder or interested in wildlife, the Samsung is definitely the way to go. Here are low light shots in Chester, Connecticut. You can see the Samsung compresses the dynamic range, so less detail is lost in the extreme highlights. Let's zoom in. It's close, but I think the Pixel's image looks more natural. I don't mind that the lights are blown out because that's what lights look like. We don't need to see the detail of the bulbs. Additionally, you can see the Pixel's less distorted. The lines here are straighter, whereas they're leaning in heavily on the Samsung. Tried to compare the performance of the telephoto lenses, but you can see both smartphones continue to use the wide angle lens and just crop when you tell it to zoom at night. However, in this scenario, the Pixel did much better. Comparing the iPhone to the Samsung, you can see again, the iPhone has less distortion than the Samsung does, and the iPhone's dynamic range is more compressed. The iPhone is sharper by the corners and is handling the bursts of light better than the Samsung, probably because of better optical quality. Look how much better this sign looks than on the Samsung. When I zoomed in on the iPhone, it actually used the telephoto lens rather than just cropping. Let's see if it made a difference in quality. Wow, the iPhone's telephoto lens at night looks so much better. You can see the detail of these individual boards. Look how much clearer these signs are. The Samsung's telephoto lens is better during the day, but the iPhone's is better at night. Here's the secret to the best photos. Image quality is important, but the most important thing is that you know about things like lighting, composition, depth, leading lines, all of the secrets that make your pictures great. And that's why we have the book, Stunning Digital Photography, because Tony here has written about 36 books and he puts it all in here. What, you're saying they can't just buy a, a camera and get great pictures, they actually have to learn something? Yeah. That seems unfair, yeah. Chelsea. Okay, maybe you also wanna do a little post-processing. That's fair too. We have books on Lightroom and Lightroom Classic, as well as the amazing Photoshop item. Use the coupon code S22 to get 22% off of these items. Thanks. Next, we're gonna test how each phone performs in portraits, which I think is pretty common. And we're gonna put it up against the standard, and this is a Canon 85 millimeter f12 and that gives you that nice smooth background that i think each of these phones is trying to replicate so let's see which what the real thing does first before we look at the focus on each phone with a traditional camera the photographer chooses the aperture at the time of shooting measured in f-stops higher f-stop numbers offer less background blur lower f-stop numbers offer more background blur and bigger bokeh balls now i'll try the same thing with each phone the background is blurring artificially, but it's kind of struggling with the trees in the background and it just doesn't look natural. 
Comparing the iPhone to the Samsung, the iPhone's exposure is a little better. I'm a little dark on the Samsung. At this zoom level, the background blur from both looks pretty natural, but let's zoom in. We can see the Samsung has way over sharpened my face. It looks terrible. I see some ugly artifacts on the iPhone as it transitions to the blurry background. The Samsung actually handled it better here, though there is some weirdness visible. Let's compare the Pixel to the Samsung. Oh my God, what is the Pixel doing? I, I promise I do not look like this. Why would it over sharpen my face that much? Ugh. That actually looks nice. Let's compare the backlit portraits of Chelsea. You can see the iPhone does too much processing on the face. It's eliminated all the shadows and made her face look flat. However, the background looks nice. The Pixel, well, we can see there's too much sharpening from here. Her face looks too textured and there's not enough background blur. Even at this zoom level, some bokeh artifacts are very apparent. The Samsung looks pretty good. In fact, it looks the best of the three. The skin tone and shadows on her face look natural and the bokeh looks pretty good. Let's zoom in. The iPhone doesn't show too much detail on Chelsea's face and looking at the bokeh around the edges, we see nice smooth transitions, nothing that's upsetting. The Pixel has way too much detail, and if we zoom in, well, it makes everybody look like a monster. Checking the edges of the bokeh, we see hard, unnatural transitions. This is bad, and I wouldn't use it for portraits. The Samsung, on the other hand, looks great. Maybe there's a little bit too much sharpening, I wish it would back off of that. And the edges here aren't as natural as the iPhone. This transition here is obviously fake. And look at this awful mess. Front lighting produced similar results. Again, the iPhone is a little too red, but it handles the bokeh transitions better. The Samsung's a little over sharpened, but has better color, and the bokeh transitions are more awkward. The quality on the Pixel is potato because it uses the wide angle lens and then crops deeply rather than having a dedicated telephoto lens for portraits. All these smartphones allow you to edit the portraits in post, including adjusting the background blur on the phone. However, the iPhone will automatically transfer the pictures to your iPad or MacBook, so you can edit it in a real user interface. Here you can see I can increase the background blur or decrease it. I can also adjust the light and the color. And I mentioned the lighting on our face was too flat, but I can change that here. Here's the original and here's the edited photo. This workflow of switching between the iPhone and the computer is a real benefit to the iPhone and Apple infrastructure. The two Android phones automatically sync to Google Photos. In a web browser, Google Photos has pretty powerful editing capabilities. However, the browser interface does not give you complete control over portrait editing, like controlling the background blur. So it's simply not as powerful. We tested portraits in selfie mode. You can see the Pixel and the Samsung had a wider angle selfie lens, which is helpful if your arms aren't super long. The iPhone, however, looks generally the best. The image is the highest contrast. The optics on the lens are probably better, and that's why they're not as washed out. The iPhone gave us the best exposure for the faces too. There's one last thing I wanna try, and that is portrait video, where it tries to blur the background in a video. That's way more com complicated because it has to do it 30 times a second, and it has to not have any weird jumps between them. So let's see if we can replicate that shallow depth of field video look. I complained a lot about the Samsung's bokeh transitions and still photos, but in the video you really don't notice it, and it does add some nice background blur. The Pixel totally lacks this feature, and by comparison the video ends up looking flat and like it came from a smartphone, which it did. The iPhone cinematic video was my favorite. Watch as we pull focus from the face to the trees and then back to the face. Amazing. You don't even have to think about this while you're filming because you do this in post-processing. Check it out. Like portraits, you can edit it on your MacBook. You can also adjust the depth to blur the background or to make it sharp. You can even change the focus point in post. And there I just created a focus pull. Watch as I play it back and the focus shifts. Nice and smooth, and it actually looks really natural. Scrubbing through this very dramatic footage, I really don't see any noticeable artifacts of the fake bokeh. Okay, I take that back. There's a little bit there, but overall it looks really good, and just playing it back, I think it passes. The iPhone and Mac software also includes presets that really do give it a cinematic look. This is known as grading, and you can do it with any clip. It's just nice that it's built into the iPhone and the Mac. This is before processing, and this is after processing. It does look cinematic, but you're limited to 1080 at 24 frames per second. 
I often need to get really close to show the fine detail of subjects. Let's find out which of these three smartphones lets you capture the most intense detail when you get really close. On the iPhone and the Samsung, I'm going to use the ultra wide camera. After my testing, they seem to get closer than any other camera. On the Google Pixel, I use the medium camera to get as close as possible. Let's see which captures the most detail of these flowers. You can see even at this distance, the Samsung clearly has the most detail. The iPhone here also has bad color. Everything turned orange. Both the Pixel and the Samsung had more detail than the iPhone, but, but let's check a specific detail on these two smartphones. You can see the Samsung has far more detail than the Pixel. In fact, it shows way more detail than I could see with my eye. For macro shots, the Samsung wins by a big margin. I hear all the time that you need a traditional camera to take astrophotography, but it's just not true. In fact, these are way more sophisticated than traditional cameras. You can hand hold eight second long exposures. And if you put them on a tripod, like with my Memento mount, they will take up to four minute exposures in the case of the Google Pixel. So let's see how they actually compare. Let's look at the best results I got with all three cameras, which were taken on a tripod. The iPhone on the left shows more shadow detail. Let's zoom in. This is Orion's belt. You can see the iPhone shows far more details in smaller stars. The Samsung loses this detail. Of these two, the iPhone is definitely better for astrophotography, but let's check out the Pixel. The Pixel is certainly noisier than the Samsung. They seem to show about the same number of stars. The Google Pixel's four minute exposures are particularly amazing, but this Samsung and its 200 plus millimeter lens can actually take really good pictures of the moon. Check it out. Before we look at the still photos, check out this video I made of the moon. This is 4K at 60 frames per second and then magnified 800%. The detail is pretty amazing. The little waves you see are variations in the atmosphere. Here are the results from photographing the moon with the Google Pixel, the iPhone 13 Pro, and the Samsung. The Samsung's telephoto lens is actually pretty amazing and it was able to extract the detail from the craters on the moon. Now let's go inside and we'll try out some video stabilization and low light video tests. To test video stabilization, I turned on active stabilization on the two Android phones and walked with each of the three smartphones. The Pixel looks the best, followed by the iPhone. The Samsung, even with active stabilization, was a little jerky. For my low light video test, I'm in a dim basement with Pixel the dog. The Pixel is noisy in low light. Not related to the phone. The Samsung selfie camera looked a little better in low light. The iPhone selfie camera was very dark, and when I raised it in post, it didn't look good. Let's test the main rear camera in low light. Uh, first, the Pixel 6 Pro, which is extremely noisy, but very stable. This is the Samsung S22 Ultra. It has noticeably less noise. It looks significantly better. The winner though is the iPhone 13 Pro. The noise reduction is excellent and didn't eliminate too much detail. I did have to raise the exposure a little bit. It was dark by default. Testing the telephoto lenses in low light, the pixel again is very noisy. The Samsung looks much, much better. The iPhone was way too dark. I raised it in post and it still looks pretty bad. For telephoto, get the Samsung. All right, so let's summarize our findings and we'll start with the iPhone 13 Pro. It's an all around great camera. It created the best portraits. The cinematic video looked the best. The MagSafe mounting is absolutely amazing, but it clearly lost macro photography and telephoto photography. Another thing that I consider a pro and con with Apple products is that you buy into the whole system and once you're in it, you're kind of stuck there. And I am kind of regretfully so stuck there. I have the watch, the phone, the MacBook Pro, and they're nice and I like them, but they make it deliberately more difficult to buy out of their system. So if that's not the lifestyle you want, you might want to steer clear. Next, we have the Google Pixel 6 Pro. At $900, this one's a bargain, especially because it has the best color, especially in portraits. It has handheld long exposures and panning. It has a four minute astrophotography feature. Uh, it has great low light capabilities and it has a better telephoto lens than the iPhone. But not quite as good as the Samsung's. Also, it's lacking Foca video, like video with a fake blurred background, 
a feature I'd kind of like to see maybe in a firmware update. And next is the Samsung S22 Ultra at $1,200. It's the most expensive, but it has the most detailed images if you use the 100 megapixel mode, which is not default. You have to select it. So it's the most detailed images for up close macro photography or far away telephoto photography. And that makes it a much more versatile tool. Landscape photographers, sports photographers, wildlife photographers, it's nice to be able to bring far away subjects up close. The portrait video also looks really nice, but I'd say its biggest downfall is its color in the photos. It looks pretty unnatural, but it, that's something that could be fixed with a firmware update. Yeah, but I don't know if I can get over it until they fix those colors. In the comments down below, let us know which of these three you think is the best. Subscribe to see our upcoming review where we'll put one of these up against a real camera to decide if you even need to buy a real camera anymore. I think you do, but I'm biased. <laughs> and don't forget to check out Stunning Digital Photography and our other photography training, all available at Northrop.photo. Use the coupon code S22 to get 22% off. Bye. I locked it. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs>